What's up, y'all? Man, I'm I I I uh, I'm kind of ooh guitar pick. This is great. Someone said ADHD. I got it. There you go. That's yours. I, I was bummed. I wanted y'all to be I wanted y'all to be up here um, because I want I wanted to be close when we first met each other. But that's okay. We're we're up here. I might come down there. The tech guy says I'm allowed uh, to come down there. I might come back to the back row. Might walk in the aisles. Is that all right? We got like seven churches here. Is that right? Right. Seven churches. Where are you all from? The hospital? Up the road? Oh. You going to sit in the front row the whole time? Uh, are you sure? Okay. Because you might want to rethink it if you got jokes like that for me tonight. It's all right. I got two kids, man. I deal with four-year-olds all the time. Your wit cannot outwit me. Uh, wait. So the hospital? That's church number eight. What about the other seven? Gainesville, Gainesville Florida, Georgia. Missouri. Missouri. Let's go. I didn't know there was a Gainesville, Missouri, but I like What's your church's name? Freedom Church. Freedom Church. Oh, what a great thing to have. Freedom. Amen, Freedom Church. Who are, the, who are the adult leaders and staff from Freedom Church? I love you guys. What's up? Let's just do this because that would take a really long time. Hey, if you are a, a youth staff member, okay? If you're a staff member paid or unpaid, okay? So volunteer leaders, wait in a second. But you're a church staff member. Can you stand up really quick? We just want to honor you today. I want to see who I'm hanging out with. We got my, my Tennessee friend. That's good honor. That's good honor. Okay, okay, yeah. You with me, you with me. He's good, he's good, he's good. No, stay up, stay up, stay up, stay up, stay up, stay up. Guys, we got to show them you got something to be proud about, okay? It's not, it's like, it's like if my wife were to like be up here with me and she's like, yeah, I'm with him. You guys are like, yeah, I serve and build the kingdom of God. Guys, we honor you. We're so thankful for you guys, for real. Pastor Aaron, I'm, I'm so glad to be here. I, I, I'm honored. This is a great, great church. You guys, one more time, can we put our hands together for our staff? Our youth staff wouldn't be here without them. That's great. All right, y'all can sit down. Hey, what about my youth leaders? Where are my, my volunteer youth leaders, youth volunteers, event staff? Stand up, stand up, stand up. Yeah, I love y'all. Dude, how old are you? How old are you? Yeah. You're a leader? Darn straight, my guy. What's your name? Hey, William, if this guy keeps mouthing off, I need you to take care of him tonight, okay? That, that's, that's my middle name, and that's my dad's name. And my dad's dad's name, but my mom in the hospital named me Jonathan William because my dad, stay up, come on. Pastor Aaron gave this great speech about paying attention and y'all sat down and I didn't say to sit down. Stand up, stand up. William's not the only one I'm talking to, but except right now I'm talking to just you, William. And so my mom named me Jonathan William because she felt like she wanted to break the curse and the pattern of the men in my family. But guess what, guess what God told me to do? I have two girls right now. Dom, should we show them the picture? Let's show them, Okay. That's my family. That's my wife, Amanda. Amanda Rose. Then my, my oldest, Sayla Rose. She's four. Uh, I, she had a spider bite on her foot from a camp I preached in Alabama. And I popped that sucker because her doctor told me that that's what I should do. So I'm not really brave. It was awesome, though. Should have brought that video, Dom. Um, and then, um, like, I should have. Dom didn't do anything wrong. It's my best friend. Dominic's my best friend in the whole building right there, you guys. We're hanging out tonight. I'm preaching to him and for him. Uh, and then that's my baby, Zaria Zeal. She's 10 months old. She's kind of like a little turtle around my house. She, like, scoots around. It's just really weird. She looks like me. And I don't know how to deal with that. So here's what I'm going to do, though, William. So my mom named me Jonathan William. So Jonathan, I go by John, um, to break the curse. But God told me, I'm going to have a son, and I'm going to name him William, and I'm going to reverse the curse. The devil does not get to have the name William Rush in my family. So I'm glad you're here, and I'm glad you're leading at 13. How, you guys are leaders. How old are you guys? 12? What church are y'all from? What church? Y'all are from this church? Wow. That's amazing. I'm so glad y'all are here. Okay, put your hands together for all of our volunteer <laughs> leaders, students, staff. This is great. This is great. I love it. I love it. I love it. I, I, I understand um, that, uh, that this church was uh, started in 2011, and uh, that was a year after I graduated high school. And I love saying that number because to some of you, that means I'm incredibly old, and to some of you, that means I'm incredibly young. This is such an interesting age to be alive, okay? Um, so would anyone... Let's just do, I do this sometimes, based off of appearances, how old do you think I am? 29? Thank you. What's your name? 
Yeah, I don't want to call you hospital guy the whole night. What is it? I'm going to call you hospital guy. I don't know if I can trust you. Did you say 29, 30? What about 35? Okay. 25? Okay. I'm th- I'm, I'll be 31 in August, okay? And in an uh, uh, what? I was born in 1992. You're so good at math. Oh my God. Are you in honors? AP? Your mom was born the same year as me. Let's go. What's your mom's name? Let's send her a video. Come on. Come on. Let's do it. Oh, I'm so sorry. She passed away. What, her name was Jasmine though. When did she pass away? 2015. Who do you live with now? Your grandma. What's her name? Beverly. Can we send Beverly a video? Should we do that? I want to say hi to Beverly. M- Uma? I can't trust. I'm talking to you tonight. Uma? Okay. He says she's me. Don't talk about Beverly that way, okay? You don't know, okay? You're both up. Okay, William, get these guys. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Let's say Be- Beverly. No, just point it at me and hit the thing. Beverly <laughs> or Uma. I don't know if that's real. I hope that's not disrespectful, but, but you, you have uh, uh, done a fantastic job. My name is John. I'm preaching here tonight at your church, and I just want to say hello, and I hope to get to meet you someday. You're amazing. God bless you. Everyone give it up for Beverly. So, yeah. Okay. You know my name. You know my age. You see my family. Um... Yeah, 2011, and when I pulled up to this church, um, I did not know what I was going to find out here in Mountain Ton, Mountain Home, but I started getting excited on the way up. You know why? First, I passed through a town called Yellsville. Yell. Well, it's got yell in it, and I'm a preacher, and I was like, okay, yell. I started getting excited in my spirit. I said, thank you, God. And then... Oh my gosh, if you don't feel the Holy Spirit off of this one, you are dead on the inside or you haven't been saved yet and you're in the right place. Then I drove through a town called Gasville. My goodness, thank you, Jesus. We lo- mm. So if anyone has a shirt that says Gasville on it, please give it to me. That is the most fire name for a town ever. I'm going to vote that my town name should not like farts. Dude, you are crazy, okay? W- William, that strike five for this guy. I'll give him 18 strikes. Yeah. William. My, well, he hasn't been born yet. So we're kind of believing by faith. You know what I mean? And also I kind of really don't want more kids cause it's a lot of work, but you know, we'll wait a couple years. His, well, his name would be William Rush. So what I want to name him is William Zion Skywalker Rush. Okay. Because I have two girls and I'm going to name my son, whatever the heck I want. Okay. I already told my wife and your middle name is Rush? You're William Rush? Let's go, dude. Come up here and dap me up. Come here, come here, come here. Your middle name is Rush? Is he lying? Leaders, confirmation. William Rush, my guy. And I'm Jonathan William Rush. Let's go. Let's go. Man, we got to get a photo after this. This is great. That was crazy. You're laughing about farts. He's, he's fulfilling prophecies. What did you, what did, is, that, is that what we're here? Gasville. This dude goes, <laughs> I got like, those girls are like eight years old and they lead here. Oh, you have a shirt. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I was, was I being judgmental? Was I jumping to conclusions? Oh, I'm sorry, dude. But now you got me thinking <laughs> Gasville does sound kind of crazy <laughs> in a negative way. Okay. But we're going <laughs> to, so I got to this church and I'm like blown away. You guys, this is an amazing church. Y'all know, like, like all seven churches are amazing, but can we thank this house for hosting this amazing event? And uh, I'm, I'm so thankful for my senior pastors, Pastor Stephen and Holly, but I also know that this house has amazing leadership and vision from Pastor Vince and Jennifer. Can we put our hands together for the senior leaders of this house? Y'all don't even know. I don't even know. Only God knows. All that it took to build this house. Okay, so while I, Dom, we're not going to use like 60% of what I sent you. Um, 
So I had this message I was going to preach, okay? And it was called, uh, y'all are going to get two messages for the price of one tonight, but in not that much time. Does that sound good? Are you ready? Okay, okay, write something down and write it on your, okay? So here's what I was going to preach, all right? I was going to preach this message called Bully in the Brain. And I was going to talk about the life of David and how he faced a lot of external obstacles, but really the most difficult obstacles he faced were the internal uh, voices in his head. And you're like, where do we ever see that? Well, it's called Psalm. So David is like venting. He's freaking out. We see a lot of the internal turmoil. And in fact, at a young age, David had kind of a story like me. His dad, Jesse, didn't even like him. So he lived his whole life wondering, am I worthy? My dad didn't even choose me, et cetera, et cetera. Then he's got this like brother right before he kills Goliath. Y'all heard when David killed Goliath? Yep. Familiar story. Yep. And, um, and then I was going to tell you about how, man, that wasn't even the hardest battle he fought that day because he had, and I was going to do it like this. I was going <sighs> to, sorry guys, sorry, Mike guys. Um, sorry, whoever has to use his mic afterwards, a rapper probably. Hey, how come preachers go before the rappers, dude? I thought the rapper guys had the energy, man. So, okay. So whoever's rapping tonight can thank me for what's about to happen in this room tonight. Okay. And thank the Holy Spirit. Okay. Sorry. I might rap. I'm, I might have a couple bars. Maybe he'll invite me on stage tonight. That'd be awesome. I've never been on stage with a rapper before. I, I'd be excited. I'd be excited. So I was going to say the hardest battle David fought that day was not against Goliath. And then you guys were going to go, <gasps> that goes against everything I've ever heard and everything I've ever thought about and everything that I've ever seen in Sunday school and on YouTube. John, please tell us what was the hardest. And I was going to say, man, right before he fought a giant, his oldest brother who was supposed to be there for him, who's supposed to be the voice of encouragement, who's supposed to gasville him up, was actually the one that was making him question himself. And then I was going to talk to you about how, man, the key to uh, beating the external battles in your life is winning the internal battles in your life and that, that the way to overcome anxiety was through identity and you were going to be like, man, I can do it. Let's fight it. But as I'm... Was that a pretty good, was that a pretty good message? All right, that, that, that's message number one. But then God, God, God kind of messed it all up. And, and uh, so I, I came here, I was on the plane, I was praying... I was thinking about you guys. This is my fifth week in a row of traveling this summer. I'm gas filled, okay? I'm just tired, all right? Um, but I'm so pumped to be here. Yeah. Hospital guy gets it. And um, I'm so tired, but I, I'm, I'm pumped. I'm praying. And literally, I, I, I kind of had this image. I was coming to box out the devil in your head for you tonight. That's what I was like, kind of my imagery. I was coming. I was, I was ready to swing. I, I was ready to punch some of the voices in your head. I know that you, I know that you've got some and, 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 but God kind of flipped the script on me in, in worship. Cause I'm looking around the room and God's like, that's not what you're going to preach. We're using some of the verses. Don't worry, Dom. And I feel like I thought I was coming here to, to step into the ring with the devil, but God told me I'm actually here to step into the ring with you. That's why I, that's why I asked if you want to sit in the front row. And, and, and what y'all got to know about me is I, I have fun like Nobody you know, but when I flip the switch, ooh, I like Crocs. Shh, shh, shh. I'm, d- I'm done with you. I like Crocs guy. He's been just leaned in quiet. When I flip the switch and I open up this word of God and I bring what the Holy Spirit from heaven deposited for me to help be a conduit for on earth, it's, it's not games. He gets it. And, 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 there's a character in this message that I had intentionally left out in part because it messed up an acronym I made in that sermon and in other part because I feel like it's really overplayed. And this guy's name is Saul. I preached about Jesse, his dad, uh, who didn't think he was worthy. I I was going to preach about Eliab, his older brother, who questioned David's heart. Then I was going to end it talking about Goliath, who was questioning the outcome of what David was stepping into But God told me, no, 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 forget those three characters and let's bring Saul to the forefront. And I'm going to preach you a message. I've never preached it before. It's happening right now in real time during worship. Some of y'all weren't encountering God at all during worship, but some of us were. And in fact, I was open so much to what God was saying. He gave me a whole new sermon for tonight. And maybe you missed what happened in worship, but you ain't going to miss what's about to happen in the next few minutes. Because the message I'm going to talk about tonight, it's called uh, the friend you never had. The friend you never had. Some of you have really good friends and you're like, oh my gosh, you're like the friend I never had. You're the best friend. Yeah. Well, I grew up not having many friends. Same. Yeah. 
In fifth grade, I'm, what do you, why are you saying what do I mean? I'm about to tell, what do you think I'm going to do? Just leave on a cliffhanger? When I was in fifth grade, I switched from being in homeschool and private Christian school to public school. Yikes. And uh, I moved to rural Minnesota. It's kind of like mountain town, tin, tin town here. Mountain home. mountain home. Okay. Why do mountains need a home? Shouldn't this, shouldn't this town just be called Earth? Isn't Earth the home of the mountains? Okay, mountain home, mountain home. I mean, no disrespect. And um, everyone at that school is a small school. They had like two things in common. They were like farmers, legit, um, and they played football. I did neither of those things. I was from the city, and I rode into school the first day with my three-in-one illustrated copy of the Lord of the Rings trilogy, okay? Not the DVDs or the Blu-rays, the books written by J.R.R. Tolkien during World War I, okay? Step back, J.K. Rowling. This dude wrote it in a war, okay? And I did not understand why they made fun of me. I understand now why they made fun of me. But at the time, it just eluded me why I didn't seem to have any friends. But then as I got older, I started to develop friends. And I realized very quickly that there's a difference between people you're friends with and people who act like your friends. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Fake friends? And, and, and God, came, God, God told me to tell you tonight that there's a lot of you who are finding false comfort in fake friends. Okay? Matthew chapter 4. There we go, Dom. Matthew chapter 4. Jesus has just been baptized. It's a beautiful moment, a transcendent, resplendent, splashing moment. And I really feel like God kind of showed me, again, there's seven churches here representing a lot of different people. But I really feel like so many of you are coming into this moment actually on a high note. You're, you're kind of coming into this moment, or at least because you're in this room, you feel like you're in a good place with God. And Jesus was in a really good place with God the Father in Matthew chapter 3. He was baptized. God opened up heaven and said, yeah, that guy, that's my son in whom I'm well pleased. Everyone saw it. A dove came down to represent the power of God and the Holy Spirit on Jesus. It was, it was amazing. But then in Matthew chapter 4, the following takes place. It says, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Sounds like a Travis Scott lyric from Utopia. It sounds messed up. It sounds jarbled. It sounds like not right, you know? Like I was listening to that because I don't really, honestly, most days I don't make it past worship music. That's just the status of my life. I'm like, I just don't have extra time in my life to be knowing what Selena is doing anymore or anything. I'm just trying to make it out here in these dad streets, okay? I'm just trying to help people. I'm just trying to keep my, keep, Keep my brain intact, Crocs guy. But today, I was like, you know, this guy, Travis Scott, put out, a, put out an album. I wonder, I wonder what's good. I wonder what's going on. He talks about God in it. And as I'm listening to songs that are about, like, thanking God and stuff, I'm like, oh, man, you sure? I think, we, I think we have different versions of maybe who God is. Maybe your album should have, like, lowercase g God. I don't, I don't know. So this verse kind of sounds like somebody who doesn't know God talking about God. Because how many of you came to church tonight to hear that God wants to lead you into the desert to be tempted by the devil? No one claps for that. No, 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 I'm, I'm not saying you should. I'm not saying you should. I mean, do, do, do what you do. I, I want to let you know that, that, that so often in life, the next step in the growth of your faith isn't a triumph, it's actually a test. And, and I came to talk to just a few people tonight because not everyone is going to get this. Some people will, will, will honestly, um, honestly came for something different. Hey, that's your last one. Look at me. That's your last one. You yawned audibly. Hey, that's your, hey look at me. That's your last one. That's your last one. That's your last one. That's your last one. I, I, I tried to warn y'all. When the switch gets flipped, we're not playing games. I, I can have fun with the rest of them but literally proves what I felt like God told me to impart to some of you is that actually some of you've got it too easy. And, and here's the dangerous thing about a false sense of comfort 
is, is the dangerous thing about a false sense of comfort is it feels like comfort, but it's actually dangerous. Here's what's dangerous about a fake friend. They feel like a friend, but they're really plotting. Here's what's dangerous about some of the friendships and alliances you've made with people and things in your life is that you think because they promise you something that feels good, that means that they want good for you. And I understand it can be confusing. And guys, I literally had a message that's like, was going to encourage you. And I feel on assignment to challenge you. And I don't know you. I don't know why. But here I am telling you about the God that wants to lead you into the wilderness to be tempted to the devil and try to convince you that Jesus is your real friend and other things in life are the fake friend. When it seems like from that verse, God's trying to set you up. Here's the difference between when someone else is trying to set you up and when God is putting you in a testing season. The person that's setting you up has no idea what is next in your life because they are not your creator. The person who is setting you up or plotting is, has no idea what you really need because they're not your father in heaven. They did not make you. They did not name you. They did not put the amazing gifts, identity, and abilities in your life. The thing about God, though, is that when he sends you into a wilderness season, when he sends you into a testing season, when he puts you in a position of pain, it will always produce purpose. It will produce a greater fire of your faith and maturity to do more of what God has called you to do. Goes on to say, after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Right here is is already this, this big duel. God is asking Jesus to do hard, painful, boring things. The devil is saying, hey, I know you're hungry. Here's some bread. So often in life, in your effort to follow a good God, you only follow him in moments that feel good and seem good. But God will lead you into moments that seem terrible, but to develop trust. I brought a video of, uh, of, of my daughter we were, when we were on this Alabama trip, right before she got bit by a spider. I don't know if it was right before. I don't know when she got bit. I was trying to literally make her eat her vegetables. Dom, can we show that video? There it is. Do we have the audio? It's okay if not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I ain't ready. So put it back in your mouth. Shoot, shoot, shoot. Wash it down with water. You're making it worse than it needs to be. Bill, you know, I spend more candy on the strip. You can't even eat some. Okay. I'm trying to get her to eat vegetables. She, she's acting like she hates asparagus. I pulled the, the awesome parenting trick of If you don't eat your vegetables, you get no ice cream and candy. (laughs) Which, from a dietician's point of view, that seems like it's just kind of a counterbalance, okay? Kind of just seems like I'm having her eat vegetables and then we're gonna counteract it with ice cream. But, But guys, I literally think that some of you tonight as I'm preaching, as I'm talking, I know I'm ruffling feathers. I know, that, I know that you're like, who is this guy, dude? Who is this guy? Even some of the leaders are like, they're gonna talk to my kids that way. They don't know how much I pray for them. Listen, I'm not, listen. I'm not here suspect of anybody. I'm just here on assignment. And I literally, I I, I honestly think that some of you are like my daughter and God is holding the next thing of growth in God in front of you and you keep turning your face down. Because the initial salvation, the initial baptism, the initial feel good moments at church and at the altar were so amazing and they felt so good and you were on your Instagram, you were deleting Snapchat, you were telling everyone about it. You got baptized in Matthew three, this is amazing. I love Jesus, oh, it feels so good. I broke up with that boy, it feels amazing. But now you have thought, you have become mistaken in thinking that the only way that a good God leads you is through things that feel good and you have made alliances or maintained relationships with fake friends. You see, in this scripture, it would appear as if the devil is trying to help Jesus. He's hungry, right? 40 days without eating, it's a lot. 40 days without eating, the devil's just trying to feed him a little bread. What's wrong with that? Isn't that what you would do if you saw Jesus Christ 
starving in the desert, would you not give him a sandwich? But isn't it interesting? Look in, look at me. Isn't it interesting how there are certain moments in life that in order to do what seems logical would actually mean we defy heaven's purposes? Guys, I don't want to be up here like, you know? When I have to discipline my daughter, I hate doing it. But I want you to know tonight that some of you have had it too easy. And I want to maybe have some of your leaders back or leaders put a backbone in you or encourage you and embolden you. These are not tired puppies. You are men and women of God. You are image bearers of the God of heaven and you were made to carry eternal fire. All that we see in the New Testament that went into building the physical temple of God in the Old Testament, the gold, the stone, all the wood, all the guys, there's chapters and chapters and chapters. Do you know what is the conduit and the resting place of the Holy Spirit fire of God? It's you. You make Captain Marvel look like a dang rookie. She can't, Carol Danvers can't carry anything compared to what God so willingly made Rest in those of us who follow Jesus. Okay. So how do you know what, what, what to do? I, I, I think a very key, a very key uh, question to ask is what in my life seems like a friend but is actually holding me back? This could be relationships. This could be uh, ways that you cope with things. This could be just agreements you've made in your mind about what it means to be William Rush, what it means to be you, what it means to be a part of your family. When I was in ninth grade, I convinced my mom to let me go back to homeschool, but this time it was online homeschool. And she was, she was the only one raising me. My dad wasn't around and she worked. So God bless my mom. She did so many things right. But as a freshman, this is just, I'm savage. Get like me. Or I mean, don't, don't. It's terrible. But uh, guys, it's great. I convinced her in ninth grade to let me do online homeschool with no supervision every day. Thank you. Thank you. That is how. I am brilliant. And guess what I did for months? Nothing. <laughs> guys, I played so many video games. One video game specifically is this game called World of Warcraft. It's still popular now. Oh, wow, yeah, let's go for the Alliance. Yeah? You guys don't know about it that much. Okay, I don't know. I just felt like you guys were fans and then you left me hanging there on the reference, but that's okay. Just back to fifth grade again, being bullied by football players. It's fine. So I made this friend. His name was Matt. Or in game, we called him Winin'. He was a level 60 paladin on the Crush Ridge server. And he was like the best friend I had at that time. He, however, lived in England. And for like two years, he was one of the realest friends I had. And we, we played this game together, we leveled up. I'd get, we'd get on voice chat, there's this software called Ventrilo before there was even like really cell phones. It was great. And this very real helpful friend who was helping me so much, when my mom found out that I wasn't actually doing any schoolwork, what do you think is the first thing that she took away from my life? First, my consciousness, and then food, and then water. No, video games. And so I've worked hundreds of hours on my character. My character was called Crunkness. I was a druid, okay? Let's not get into any of that, okay? I was not a Christian at the time, okay? I was just very into early 2000s rap. And I thought, I don't want my character to like go to waste. So I'll just give my friend, my best buddy Matt, my login info to my account, of which I had worked hundreds of hours on. Because my friend, whining from the UK, We'll take care of this precious digital, you know, it was like, to me it was like an NFT at the time. Well, that was the last day I ever heard from my friend, Matt. 
He stole my account, and I believe he sold it for like something like $700 or something like that. Yeah. No, I, I, got, I got nothing. I got this story that I'm telling you now. But, but this, is, this, is, this is why I tell this story. Some of you guys have been in long-term relationships with people and things that have not sold you out, but are setting you up. And right now, it might not be apparent to you that vaping is a problem. It might not be apparent to you that that girl is bad for you. It might not be apparent to you that the person you sit next to literally every time at youth is actually distracting you from receiving a divine calling from God, but you keep sitting next to them. It, it, it might not be apparent to you um, that, that your older sister actually does not know better than your dad. It might not be apparent to you that the people who you model your life after on TikTok, who are on more medication than anyone you've ever met, who are, have all the money and all the accolades and the things you want, but are more miserable than you on your worst day. It might might not be apparent to you that they are a setback, but what if right now, before the trap sprung, you could get out of it? And, and, and David found himself in a similar position as Jesus did. I got the keys person come up. David was here. He was on assignment. He was, he was going there to, to find, uh, uh, really just to deliver his brother's cheese. And he actually found himself on the precipice of one of the biggest moments of his, of his purpose. And, and this is another reminder that your purpose in God is not going to come with a bow on it. Because Jesus' purpose came wrapped in blood-soaked rags, a rugged cross, nails. That's how it ended and, and how it started was he got sent into the wilderness to be tempted and tried, but he was sent by the Holy Spirit. What a good friend God is. Ugh. And then here's David on assignment from God, not only facing a giant, Goliath, but also facing his older brother, Eliab, and then this really helpful chap named Saul. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. David was going around the camp saying, hey, that Goliath that you've all been scared of, I, I, I can do this. I, I got this. I think this is why I'm here. I think this is why I'm here. I think this is why I'm here. I think I'm supposed to do this. And he was going around the camp. And Saul was the king. He was in charge. And he said, actually, no, no, no. Come over here, David. Let me, let me help you. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. And guys, there are moments you leave youth on Wednesday or church on Sunday, and you know what God is asking you to do. You feel, you're like, no, this is it. I know what to do. And then some of you are in conversations with people and things like what Saul says right now. David, full of what he's supposed to do from God? No, 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 don't worry. Don't be afraid. I'll go and fight him. Saul says, no, you are not able to go out and fight against this Philistine. You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. How many times, think back, think back. Lean in, come here. How many times have you had an impression from God, and you go to your friends? Everyone do this, air quotes. Your friends. And they subtly, slowly, sneakily talk you out of obeying the last thing God told you to. Some of them do it because they say things like this. That's not cool. That's lame. That's weird. You did that before and you never, like that didn't help that person. And is God even real? And some of it's very blatant. Some of it's even a little bit combative. And, you're, and you kind of just get like pushed back by it. Some of you, you've got friends who will do what the devil did with Jesus in Matthew 4 and take God's own word and use it against you. You see, the devil in Matthew chapter 4 was not just randomly saying, hey, here's some bread. Do you remember what he said? He said, if you are the son of God, you have the power to call bread from nothing into reality. He's quoting scripture. He's reminding Jesus of his identity. He knows that Jesus will go on. He has an idea that Jesus will go on to break bread and multiply it. And he's, he's convincing Jesus with these good sounding things to satiate his little tummy. How many people do you let use kindness, comfort, and encouragement to actually push you away from the purposes of God? 
You know what you need sometimes more than anything from someone who loves you? A spiritual punch in the face. Keyword spiritual. Guys, just because you feel okay, just because life is good, does not mean you're being obedient to Jesus. The most lost people in our world are not the depressed, are not the anxious, are not the suicidal, are not the godless. They're the ones who have just enough Jesus to lull themselves into a false sense of comfort. They're the ones who come to church just enough to feel like, I'm okay. I know these words of this song. I've got some scripture. The worst place you can be is right where you think God wants you, but you haven't talked to him lately. You go off of last year's word. You go off of your parents' faith. You only listen to the sermons that feel good, that sound nice. You only sing the songs that, that, that you like. Do you guys know what you should do when someone is leading you in worship? You should get on your knees and worship the King of Kings. Do you know how I know if Jesus is Lord? It's the way you worship. And let me tell you, Jesus being Lord of my life is not like I magically wake up every day and like John Rush the super Christian because he's a pastor and a dad now. Jesus being Lord of my life is a decision I, don't ju I didn't just make when I was a junior in high school. It's a decision I make every single day of my life. David standing, looking, somebody telling him nice, encouraging things. You know what too? I think this is prophetic. There are gonna be some of you who someone's gonna come up to you tonight, pat you on the back and be like, don't listen to him, you're doing just fine. Run. The hardest thing I have to do as a parent to my daughter is use what I call my big voice. And it kinda sounds like when I'm preaching too, so we're gonna have to figure that out with her counselor. She's like, my dad yelled at me when he's preaching, it sounds very similar and now, you know. Holy Spirit, help me. But it's when I look at her and I go, Selah, do you want me to use my big voice? And every now and then she gets to strike 17 like hospital guy and I have to look her in the eyes and I have to, and I have to use my big voice. And sometimes my big voice is like this. Selah Rose, you will listen to your mom. You will help clean up after your dinner. Sometimes my big voice sounds like this. And sometimes it sounds like me getting on her level, looking her in the eyes, gritting my teeth and saying, Sayla Rose, I know who you are and I know that you are better than this and I know that it is not your intention to cause chaos in this family. So right now, you will do what I asked you to do. Guys, more than half the time, guess what she does? Cries and runs away. <laughs> and guess how I feel? terrible. I hate, I hate it. There are times, and I kind of, am, I am a softy, you know, this is hard for me is what I'm trying to tell you. Like, I'm not like the, everyone's going to hell preacher guy, you know, like I'm not that, like this is, for me to be preaching this message, I promise you is an act of the Holy Spirit. It's hard for me. There are a lot of times where after I make my daughter cry, guess what I start doing? <laughs> I start crying. And I have to turn my face so she can't see me, but my wife sees me and I have to, because I hate it. I hate causing her pain. But I have a choice as a parent to cause her temporary pain now to save her from permanent pain later. Because let me tell you, my job as her parent is to help her catch bad behaviors while they are small. My job as her parent is to help her realize moments of weakness that she can turn and develop into strength. And your heavenly father wants to do the very same thing for you tonight. Maybe you grew up without a dad like me. Maybe you've had a dad in your life, but he's not really even been there. Maybe it's been your mom. She's been all over the place. Maybe you haven't been raised by either of your parents. Whatever the case is, you have a heavenly father who is perfect, who's looking down at heaven, kneeling down in front of you and saying, there is more for you.
And I believe that on the other side of this message is not just multiplication for your life, but it's multiplication for every ministry that is represented in here. That it is not just from the comforting and the encouragement words that we take ground for the kingdom of God. In fact, it is through the wilderness, through the desert, through the temptation, through the testing that we will come out the other side, our full and anointed selves. David staring comfort in the face. And Saul says, you're not going to be able to go out like this. You can't fight him. David reminds Saul of all that he's done. Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it down, rescued the sheep. He kind of talks about his resume. And then Saul says, okay, I get it, I get it, I get it. Go out and fight him. Some of y'all know this story. He says, fine, go out and fight him. But take my armor. Saul is trying to helicopter parent the heck out of David. And some of you, are, are, you wish you had a little cute, nice little angel always floating over you. God just wants you to do easy things. It's so easy. It's so great. It's fine. Don't, don't quit that thing because the grace of God, that's what it's there for. Every time you look at porn, every time you get back with that person, every time you get high, you get drunk, every time you let your anger get the best of you and you make someone else feel like nothing, it's okay. That's what the grace of God is there for. You want a little tooth fairy God following you around. Let me tell you, that tooth fairy ain't an angel. It's a demon. It didn't come from heaven. It's not divine. It's demonic. It is a spirit that wants to use the words of God and, and offer comfort that will actually cripple you and one day will kill you. You don't need that relationship. You don't need nicotine to fall asleep. You don't need steroids to be stronger. You don't need that relationship to feel self-confident. You don't need to numb out your feelings with Netflix and Roblox and video games. You don't need to shut your ears to this message right now. You are made of sterner stuff. Do you hear me, young man? You're made of sterner stuff. You're made of sterner stuff. And so Saul's offering him this armor. And he's saying, take this armor, it will protect you. But David understands his anointing and identity in God and says, I cannot go in these, he said to Saul. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. Everyone on your feet right now. This is you. Making a decision if you're going to approach the Philistine or not. You're deciding right now if you're going to take the armor of Saul and protect yourself from the challenging words of God. Or if you're going to say, I don't actually need this armor. David went up against a giant. We're talking taller than Shaquille O'Neal. With some stones. Basically wearing basketball shorts. It makes no sense. It makes no logical sense that the Son of God, after being baptized, would be sent into the wilderness to starve. How can the bread of life be starving? How can the chosen one of God, David, be naked and vulnerable? There will be moments following Jesus where you feel completely weak and helpless. You feel dumb. You feel silly. You feel stupid. You feel like nothing posting that. You feel so weak saying, no, I won't go to that party. Oh, why do you go to that party? You don't even like doing what they do. You go to avoid feeling silly and stupid. It's why I get peer pressure into doing most of the stuff that I do, even now, as a pastor. Oh yeah, my deficiencies, they're not just back, back then. I've won some battles, but for every battle I've won, a new one's popped up. I gotta choose every day whether or not to embrace this very message I'm preaching you. You get to make a decision if you're going to live like David and say, I see your armor. I don't need it because I've got a God that covers me. You get a decision to, to live like Jesus and say, yeah, I see your bread, but I know the author of life. And if it's not God's will for me to eat right now, then I won't eat now. David said, if it's not my will to wear armor right now, then God will provide somehow. And notice what David took with him, his, his staff and his stones, the things he brought with him. God does not need, look at me in my pupils, my friends. God does not need you to have what they have. 
to do what he called you to do. Their armor doesn't fit you. And every time you try to force it on, it's the thing that actually constricts and cripples you. And then you begin to hate them because it works for them, but doesn't work for you. All you need is the things he sent you into this world with. There's really no such thing as learning new talents. It's just discovering what God already put there in the first place. Nothing that you find out about yourself is new to God. He knew it from the beginning. He gave it to you. He knew its use on earth. You have all that you need. You just don't know that you have it. So while the world tells you you need more and need to have more and be more, you are letting go of what God's given you in exchange for what the world says to fight with. David goes on with that stick in that stone. And he just absolutely, absolutely demolishes that giant. It's not even a contest. Do you understand me that if tonight you choose to worship in the next few moments, like you really want to live obedient to God, that you really want to look at some friendships and alliances you've made and realize you will not drop Goliath if you don't first drop Saul. Oof. You will not experience the fullness of God if you are not willing to be starved of your sin and starved of those habits and starved of those songs and starved of those friendships and starved of the seven sports you play. Maybe pick two and stop acting like church is impossible to go to because you're the one that signed up for seven sports. Yes, God wants you to be a leader on your team. But if trying to be on four teams is what costs you from being a leader on the one team you're called to, then it is not worth it. You can't go, Russell Wilson can't even go pro in more than one sport. You're going to be like Bo? Y'all don't even know who Bo Jackson is. He like snapped both of his knees anyway trying to do all these four sports. That'd be a good message. I'd have to preach that with sensitivity because a man genuinely got hurt. But Pastor Aaron will help me. the very end Satan tests Jesus a couple more times I find it interesting in, in Matthew chapter 4 verse 5 let me just give you some Bible for a second stay standing we're going to worship let me just give you some more Bible the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple he said if you are a son of God he said throw yourself down for it is written he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift up in their hands and so you will not strike your foot against a stone Jesus answered him it is also written do not put the Lord God to the test guys it's so crazy out there some of the people I'm most worried about you following on TikTok is not non-Christians it's Christians with bad theology I'm actually less worried about you following Travis Scott and more worried about following the Christian TikToker who will warp the word of God to fit whatever cultural narrative or personal comfort they want at the time you got to check the source and you've got to respond to lies with the truth. And everything that Jesus is saying is, is from the Bible. And then it says, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you if you will bow down and worship me. In verse five, it says he took him to the highest point. In verse eight, it says he took him to a very high mountain. I felt like I was supposed to tell you this. Be on the lookout for when you're low, because the devil will try to get you high. Whenever you're low, the devil actually might show up before God and offer you something that will get you high. When you're in your lowest, it's when the devil will say, here you go, buddy. If Jesus would have jumped off that temple, he would have broke his legs, broke his neck, no resurrection, no salvation, no youth conference. If Jesus would have bowed down to worship Satan, instead of being the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, he just would have been a phony. On the other side of everything the devil tempts you to get high with is a lower low than you've ever experienced in your life. And it's a low that once you're down there, it is hard to get up and it is hard to get out. And then Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. The devil might show up first, 
but God will never fail you. The devil might come early, but God is never late. You might have a thousand reasons not to trust God, but I bet you, guys, chill out. But I bet you that if you want one reason to trust God, he'll give it to you tonight. The key to understanding all that God has for you is not, is not even necessarily processing it intellectually and emotionally. That's for after. It's tonight doing what Jesus said to do, which is worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Do you know why we raise our hands in worship? You've heard it before, but let it sink in. It is a sign of surrender. It is a physical sign to ourselves, not to anyone around. I don't care if you raise your hands. It's to tell you, I am not in charge. I do not need Saul's armor. I do not need this fake bread. I do not need fake friends. I need Jesus. And let me tell you something. When the angels attended Jesus, guess what? They didn't give angel food cake. They didn't just pray for Jesus. I guarantee you they rolled out the greatest meal. God does not just want to meet your needs in this spiritual, tangible way. God wants to restore things physically in your life. When Jesus healed people, he didn't just heal them emotionally. He didn't just heal them in their head. He healed whole limbs. I promise you, the riches, the dreams, the talents, the gifts, the, the, the provision, the purpose you want, God has for you. You just have to realize who your real friend is. And if you want all that God has for you, he will attend to you. He will show up in the wilderness. He will meet you and roll out the steak dinner. Devil trying to give y'all breadcrumbs. Y'all are freaking surviving off of croutons. God wants to lay out the filet mignon because he knows what you were designed for. He knows what you need. He will give you the desires of your heart. And even when it doesn't turn out the way, man, I've prayed, God, can I have a dad? Never got a dad, but I get to be a dad. I never got my dad, but I have a father in heaven. He will meet your needs. Dumb stuff, stuff that seems dumb to you. That little video game stuff. Guys, I've led people to Jesus playing video games. So don't for a second think that whatever your little dream is, is a little dream. God gave that to you. And if you'll trust him through the wilderness and through the testing and through the challenge, the Bible says he will give you the desires of your heart. But when God gives us the desires of our heart, it's at the right time in the right way. Okay. I think I did what I was supposed to do. I love you guys a lot. I know that's a lot to unpack. The title is funny. It's the friend you never had. And it's really supposed to be a reminder that some of the things you think are your closest allies and friends and comforts were never a friend in the first place. And do not be a generation of young Christians that get lulled into a false sense of comfort because God has a purpose and a plan for your life. You know what the next chapter, after Jesus gets out of the wilderness, it says Jesus begins to preach. A lot of us wish Christianity was like this. He gets baptized and then he preaches. Mm -mm. He got baptized, he went through the wilderness, then he preached, and guess what happened after he preached? He started performing miracles. And guess what the Bible says about you? It says that you will do even greater works than what Jesus did on this earth. I wanna pray for a couple people, eyes open, this is not for everyone, but there are a couple of you who genuinely feel like God has called you to be used to lead people to Jesus, whether it's through sports, business, or ministry. And I want to pray a fresh anointing and infilling of the Holy Spirit, of encouragement, of provision, and clarity. If that's you, leader or student, put your hand in the air. I want to pray for you. If you're saying, man, I just, I just feel it, John. I'm supposed, this is, I, I'm, I'm going to lead people. I'm supposed to help people. That's great. Leaders, if you're near someone, keep the hands up. Holy Spirit, I thank you. Hmm that you have given your children everything that they need to fulfill the purposes of God on the earth. That even through tough seasons and hungry times, you will fill them up with everything they need. And I pray influence and anointing and unlocking of their talents. Their relationships will open up. Dude, coaches are going to come to you and ask you. They're going to come to you and ask you to share Jesus with teams. Do you understand me? They're going to ask you. Supernatural influence. God is going to use things that you think are so silly. There's a couple talents you have that, that you barely even feel comfortable telling your parents about. Because you're like, are they even talents? They're just things I liked when I was eight. Dude, God can use Legos. God can use your drawings. I don't know what it is, but do not doubt it. David came out with the sticks and the stones that he brought with him. 
So Jesus, I thank you that you have commissioned these people. Fill them up, God. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm gonna give you guys all the opportunity. The band, band will lead and really to just make a moment with God. This is not for you and somebody else. This is for you to ask the question. Am I really following Jesus fully? Am I really obeying him? Or do I got some armor on? Am I making deals with the devil in the desert? Do I got some fake friends surrounding me? Jesus, we thank you that your word is faithful, it's true. And you're so worthy of our worship. You're so worthy of our praise, God. Oh, you're so good, God. Every time I fall down, you help me get back up. When I'm in my lowest of lows, God, you meet me there. You're such a faithful God. Oh, we worship you, Jesus. Come on, if you're a Christian, thank your God. Come on, just in your own words, we thank you, Jesus. We worship you. We bow before you. We humble ourselves to you, God. You're so worthy, Jesus. You're so worthy that you would send heaven down, that you would even call us friend, that you would call us son and daughter. Holy, holy, holy. It's the Lord our God, Lord our God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Thank you, Jesus. So right now, some of y'all are going to eat your asparagus and you ain't never worshiped like this before. You're literally like, should I go on my knees? Should I raise my hands? Should I move away from my friend? Eat your dang vegetables tonight, kid. You have permission. Go. Move. Do what you need to do. Take a step of faith. Don't worry about who's around you. Move. Eat your asparagus. Your king, your dad, your father in heaven has more for you. Don't let anyone in this room hold you back from the worship that your God deserves and that he'll use to fill you up.